And then if you turn your Bible to uh, Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, I want to speak on the subject of um, not remembering or don't forget to remember. Don't forget to remember. And before we read the scripture, I want to uh, just let you know something that I remember is um, next week is our 40th anniversary, and 17 years ago, uh, my wife and I got married on this very stage. Uh, it would have been two days before the 23rd anniversary of Madison Baptist Church, and I remember uh, our whole time of courting or dating or whatever you want to call it, uh, that we were... Uh, firmly and still are firmly uh, convicted about not touching before marriage. Uh, we didn't touch. Not, not only that, but we always had an adult chaperone with us. I was 29 years old. You say, well, that's kind of funny. No, it's a testimony uh, for protection from us, um, protection for our, our, our testimony uh, for the future. And I remember uh, that on our, our rehearsal night, as we're going up to uh, the mock stairs that we had here, we're rehearsing to go up. She locked her arm in mine, and I about had a fit. <laughs> and I said, we're not married yet. You can't put your, what are you doing? She said, oh, we're married tomorrow. We, you, and I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> don't touch. It says, don't touch, you don't touch. That's in your pictures and your photo. Don't touch. Just period. That's just wise right there, and it's scriptural, too. I can give you chapter and verse on that one. Uh, but I also remember this, and this, this is, strikes me funny. I remember, I'm saying this because I remember, and not only how much I loved her, but how much I do still love her. Um, but I remember that Pastor had clearly told us, uh, when I pronounce you uh, husband and wife, and you go to kiss your bride, he said, I'm going to read the scripture uh, therefore, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And that's when you stop kissing. That's a long verse if you don't read them like I read them real fast. And of course, when we kissed, we did not kiss like we were practicing because we weren't. We just touched lips. That's all it was. But I'm, I'm, I'm holding the kiss until the Bible verse is read. And she starts laughing in the middle of the kiss. <laughs> what in the world? But it's a memory of, of, of our first kiss. But not forgetting to remember is, is something that's going to challenge all of us. Uh, if you look in Matthew chapter 16, uh, we're going to begin uh, reading in verse number 5. And the scripture says, and when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have not taken no, because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith. Why reason you among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you yet, do ye yet not re understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves and the 4,000, uh, how many baskets ye took up? How is it then that ye do not understand that I spake not concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not to beware of leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you again, and we do thank you for your mercies. We thank you for providing us a place of ha uh, refuge, uh, a haven of rest, if you will, in your local New Testament church today as we meet. Uh, we pray that you'll be present with us. Help me to preach, Father, uh, to clear my thoughts and mind. Fill me with the Spirit of God. Uh, that the message of God mo may go out clearly and that the Holy Spirit of God would convict us where we need convicting, that we make decisions that glorify you, not glorify man, but to glorify you. Lord, we long to seek to hear from you, and please use this message to encourage us but also convict us, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in verse 5 we see here that the disciples uh, forgot to uh, bring bread. Um, and 
but Jesus was trying to teach them something very important about doctrine of, of false religion. Uh, he's trying to teach them the doctrine of the, uh, to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, he wanted them to be aware of the teaching. Uh, that word leaven there we see is explained to us uh, in verse number, uh, let's see here, verse, and I have it right here, uh, verse number 12, uh, that he talked about the doctrine or the teachings of the Pharisees. Um, so I, I don't want to miss this point that he's telling them to be careful of uh, doctrines that don't go according to him, but according to the way of life, uh, um, a cyclopedia for Christianity a Pharisee is described as this, a Jewish, uh, Jewish religious sect of Jesus' day. Uh, the proud and hypocritical Pharisees opposed Jesus Christ and were instrument in his death. They had made the Old Testament law into unreasonable and unscriptural system of legalism and ignored the spiritual meaning God had intended to them, for them to receive. Uh, they had zeal uh, rather to make up their own religious system and to rule over the people. It is important to note that Jesus did not rebuke the Pharisees for their zeal in obeying uh, the details of the law. He rebuked them uh, for supplanting the word of God with man-made tradition and thereby making the word of God of none effect, for rejecting Jesus Christ, for, for, for perverting the gospel, for self-righteousness, and for gross hypocrisy. Uh, so this was the doctrine of the Pharisees. Uh, the doctrine of the Sadducees is some that had probably affected the disciples here, uh, because the Sadducees is also another group of religious leaders of the day of Christ. Um, the Sadducee did not believe in miracles. Uh, so they would reject the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, the, the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, and so if their doctrine infected the, the disciples, maybe that's why they didn't focus on the miracles that had taken place, not only just on the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, uh, but those other miracles that we'll go over in just a moment. They also did not believe in bodily resurrection. Jesus Christ is warning them of the false doctrine. And, and note this, that any biblical church that follows after the Word of God, follows after the Lord Jesus Christ, follows after the Holy Spirit of God, will constantly warn you of false religions, will constantly warn you of false doctrines. That's why we'll preach against Calvinism, we'll preach against baptismal regeneration, We'll preach against grace that you think covers the, the penalty of sin that you sin. And that is Calvinism, by the way. We'll preach against these false doctrines. Why? For the protecting of you, for the, for the work of the ministry, that you'll be edified and, and come into the knowledge of the Son of God. So Jesus is warning his disciples, uh, but they started reasoning among themselves. Is it because we did not bring bread? Uh, uh, Peter, I cannot believe that you forgot to bring bread. And maybe James and, and John, they're, they're arguing among themselves. And all of a sudden, Jesus perceived this. And he, he rebukes them and he says, O ye of little faith, do you not understand or remember? Or remember? Uh, do you not remember the miracles that I ha had take place? And he talks to them about some of the miracles. Uh, they didn't uh, consider the miracle of the loaves. It, it's told us in Mark 6, 52, uh, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves for their heart was hardened. And who in here hasn't forgot something that God has done for them in life uh, in their life or done for them? It's part of the human nature that we're forgetful people. Uh, but we're here today to be reminded not to forget to remember uh, something. Um, forgetfulness is something that is part of all the human race. And let me define uh, forgetfulness for you. It's the quality of losing the remembrance or recollection of a thing or rather the quality of being apt to let anything slip from the mind neglect, negligence, careless omission, inattention as forgetfulness of duty. Uh, in this passage of scripture, we have the disciples that forgot two main things, or two things. Uh, one of them is more main than the other. First, they forgot, uh, they forgot bread. Uh, now, that, that is not a big deal considering who they were with. They were with the bread maker. Uh, he took seven loaves and multiplied it for... Uh, 4,000 people, and that's not even counting women and children. So they were with the bread maker. They did not have to be concerned about the temporal. By the way, you don't need to be concerned about the temporal either, about where you're going to get your food. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his, his righteousness, and all these things he shall add unto us. Uh, he promises in his word that we can trust him uh, even in situations when we don't have bread. But they forgot the bread. But then they fo forgot the most important thing. They forgot the miracles that God had performed. Um, and, and the time as they're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, let me just give you a couple of the miracles uh, that they look past. This is going to be found in Matthew uh, chapter 12 and verse 22. It says, uh, Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him. 
insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. So you have a man that was blind. He could not talk. He met Jesus. Jesus healed him. All, the, all of a sudden, the man could see and he could speak, but the disciples let this slip because of the hardness of their heart. They didn't consider the miracle. All they were concerned with, uh, did we not bring bread? They forgot that Jesus had walked on the water. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse uh, 24, it says, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, uh, and the wind was contrary. All right, so they had a contrary journey in, in the boat. Um, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. All right, so if you can imagine this, they're in a storm. They're being tossed by the waves and the wind. All of a sudden, they see Jesus walking on the sea. In verse 26, it says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And it says they cried out with fear. And you can only imagine them screaming uh, that they see Jesus walking on water. Uh, they're screaming with fear, but straightway Jesus spake to them, saying, Be of good courage, it is I, be not afraid. They ignored these miracles. Uh, they forgot these miracles. They were more concerned about the bread that they did not bring. Uh, the other two miracles they forgot is the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. Unfortunately, as we get older uh, and we get longer in our Christian faith, we start forgetting some of the things that God has done for us in our lives. Some of the miracles, there's not one person that's innocent in forgetting the work that God has done in our life uh, in the past. And when we forget those things, we get in a very dangerous spot. Uh, if you haven't noticed this, uh, the longer you've been saved, if you, if you don't stay on fire for the things of God, they, be, they start becoming cold to you. You start getting to the point where you're so familiar with the traditions, you're so familiar with the, with the passages and the messages that that familiarity has now bred contempt and it's not as hot and as fire and as, as on fire for the Lord as you once were because you have, uh, maybe we have forgotten to remember some of the miracles that God has, has done for us. But this is not a new problem. This has been going on since mankind. I want you to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Uh, this, is, this is the warning that they got in Deuteronomy chapter 8 about forgetting God and forgetting God that works in their hearts and their lives. So again, this message is about not forgetting to remember. Not forgetting to remember. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 11, and I won't read all of these verses, we'll just uh, talk about them as we go. In verse 11 it says, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. All right, so then the question is, how are they going to forget the Lord thy God? How would a person forget the Lord thy God? How would the nation of Israel forget the Lord thy God? It tells us very clear, in not keeping His commandments and His judgments and His statutes, which I command you this day. So the way that we forget God, the way that we start forgetting to focus on God, is not keeping the law of God, not keeping uh, the commandments of God. Now, just to be very clear, we are not legalists at Madison Baptist Church. We have godly biblical standards. We are not legalists. We believe you have to be saved by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. His death, His burial, His resurrection, the moment you put your faith in Him, He seals you to the day of redemption. Nothing else you have to do to go to heaven. Nothing else you have to do to go to heaven. He saves you from the top of your head, bottom of your foot, the moment you put your faith in Christ. But then we get into the Word of God and find out what does God want us to do. Well, amazing thing, He wants us to keep His commandments. He wants to, us to follow after Him. And when we don't do those things or they become bitter to us or they become a, a point where they're grievous to us, then it shows us that we had fallen out of love with God and we forgot to obey His commandments. Therefore, we've forgotten God totally and we've gone about to establish our own righteousness. And I want to remind you today that God's love, and I'm going to give you the two great commandments. I'm not going to cover all the commandments. I'm going to cover the commandments that hit home to every one of us. The commandments are found in Matthew 22. Uh, 36 through 40. You don't have to turn there. You can. You can mark it down. I'm going to give you a lot of references. We are going to turn to some, but this is going to get home where, where the rubber meets the mo road, where it really hits home in our hearts because we're all going to struggle with this. Why? Because we still have Adam's nature upon us. Because we have Adam's nature upon us, we're going to struggle with these things. But in Matthew 23, uh, excuse me, Matthew 22, beginning in verse 36, uh, Master is the question. Master. What is the great commandment in the law? So this is the question being asked to Jesus. What is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, 
and with all thy mind. Jesus then said, this is the first and great commandment. You want to ever know what the great commandment of God is? It's this, that you love God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. This is the great commandment. This is the greatest commandment that could ever been given to mankind, that you love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And it goes on to say, and the second is likened to it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If we could get a hold of these two commandments, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and love our neighbor as ourself, that will fulfill all the law and the, and the prophets, which that means is that we'll automatically be able to overcome the other laws or to obey the other laws that God has given us, and we'll also to be able to love each other as we ought to. This is vitally important in the Christian life. And, and if, if, if you can raise your hand and say, my love for God has not grown cold at times, my love for His Word, my love for winning souls or for following after God has not gone, gone cold at times. You're not being honest with yourself. We're not being honest with ourselves. His commandment is for us to, to love Him with all of our heart. We have to do that on purpose. That's a decision, a love of action. That's a decision, a daily decision to put Him first, to wake up thinking about Him, talking to Him, uh, focusing on Him to loving Him with all our heart. And while we do that, this world is bombarding us, the flesh is bombarding us, the devil is bombarding us, not to, not to be in love with God, to steal your love away from the things of God. But God's reminding you today, don't forget to be in love with God. Don't forget to be in love with God. His judgment is statutes. Uh, in John 15, uh, 9 through 12, continue in the love of God on purpose. Keep yourself in the love of God. And, and John 15, 9 through 12 as the Father have loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things that I have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And that's a sacrificial love, folks. I can tell you this right now. Everyone's personality doesn't uh, get along with my personality. I know that from the top. I know that. Uh, my personality doesn't get along with everybody's personality, but I can honestly say I don't know anyone in this room that I do not love with a, with a godly love. I may not agree with everyone. I may not understand everyone, but I absolutely, uh, because of what God has done in my life, have, have a, a supernatural love uh, for people uh, to, to be right with God and to walk in truth and walk in love and be protected from not only themselves, but from the world and the devil and just uh, to have that sweet walk with God. But the commandment is that we love one another. Uh, in John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. So you can identify yourself how well you've kept the word of God because the Bible is very clear, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And you cannot tell me that we've always obeyed every part of the word of God. Now we strive for that and we want to do that. But in order to do that, we have to keep ourselves in the love of God, being doers of the word, not hearers only. All right, then 1 John 5, uh, 2 and 3, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when we were doing the uh, soul winning classes, uh, this was our class memory verse. Uh, the reason that this was our class memory verse because this is the motivation of why we live our Christian life. Uh, the motivation of why we seek to win souls, the motivation of why we're at church this morning, the motivation of why we seek to have that fellowship and the walk with our God uh, is because of this, uh, this sacrifice right here. But in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, look what it says. It says, for the love of... Uh, I didn't tell you the reference. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. And if you don't have this memorized, I encourage you to memorize this. But it says this, for the love of Christ constraineth us. That word constraineth is another word for motivate, to encourage. God's love for us motivates us. Why? Because, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Amen. This is motivated by the love of God to do what we do because he first loved us. Right. And in turn, we love him because of his love toward us. An illustration here on a hot summer day in Florida, a little boy uh, decided to go swimming uh, in the old swimming hole behind the house. 
In a hurry to dive in the cool water, he ran out back at the back door, leaving his shoes and his socks and his shirt uh, as he went. He flew into water, not realizing that as he swam to the middle of the lake, an alligator was swimming toward the shore. Uh, his mother in the house was looking out the window and saw the two were on, uh, getting closer and closer together. Uh, and utter fear uh, gripped her. Uh, she ran toward the water, yelling at her son as loudly as she possibly could. Hearing her voice, the little boy became alarmed and made a U-turn to swim to his mother. It was too late. Uh, just as he reached her, the alligator grabbed her. And if you know anything about alligators, alligators, as soon as they grab you, they start that roll. Uh, the alligator, as soon as um, he reached her, the alligator reached for him. Uh, from, the, uh, from the dock, uh, the mother grabbed her little boy by the arms. Just as the alligator snatched his legs. That began an incredible tug of war between the two. The alligator was much stronger than the mother, but the mother was too passionate to let go. A farmer happened to drive by, heard the screams, raced from his truck, took aim, shot the alligator. Remarkably, after weeks and weeks in the hospital, the little boy survived. His legs were extremely scarred by the vicious attack of the animal, and on his arms were deep scratches where his mother, her fingernails had dug through his flesh in effort uh, to hang on to her son that she loved so much. The newspaper uh, interviewed the little boy of the, uh, for the trauma, asked if he would show the scars. Uh, the little boy lifted up his pant leg, and then with obvious pride, he showed the reporter, but look at my, look at my arms. I have great scars on my arms too. Uh, I have them because my mom would not let go. And because the mom wouldn't let go, and this illustration is so important of how we hold to the truths of God, how we hold to the love of God, even though we're being gripped by the flesh, the world, and the devil, uh, we're not going to let go of the love of God because he's not going to let go of us. He will never let go of us, so we're going to fight with an intensity not to let go of him um, and not let go of his truth, not let go of obedience is what I'm saying I'm talking about letting go of obedience and, and walking in the Spirit and doing all the things uh, in, in, in the Word of God. If you would, turn with me over to um, uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And this, this next point is um, entitled cold love. Cold love. We had the motivating love. Uh, now we have cold love. Uh, in Romans chapter 12... Let me get there. Romans chapter 12, look at verse 9. The Bible says this, Let love be without dissimulation. Let love be without dissimulation. And before I read the rest of the verse, I want to tell you what dissimulation means. Dissimulation is a false or counterfeit appearance which conceals a real opinions or purpose, false pretense, hypocrisy. The Bible says, let your love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. The false or counterfeit appearance which conceals the real opinions or purpose uh, is not only perfected by teenagers, it's perfected by adults also. Uh, going through the motions, but not having your heart in it. Going through the daily, daily uh, duties of life, but not having your heart in it. God says, don't let your love be like that. Uh, the church of Ephesus had that problem. And if we're not careful, Madison Baptist Church will have the same problem, having love with dissimulation, not only toward God and the things of God, but also toward each other. Have a fake, manipulative kind of love where you show a certain outward appearance to get things, and you have a certain personality to get things, that's dissimulation. It's a false pretense. It's a fake love. Uh, it's not to be in the Christian's life. In Revelation 2, uh, two through five, is, uh, to the church of Ephesus, he writes this, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou cannot spare them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not and hast found them liars and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake have labor and have not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. The love has then been with dissimulation. It's now been a love that's not a real love. It's not a hot love. It's not a love that's on fire with all your mind, your soul, and your body, and your strength. Uh, the love that you should have uh, toward God, it's now become a love with dissimulation. 
And nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because I have left thy, left thy first uh, love. The Bible says, Remember, therefore, once thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first work, or else I will come uh, unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of thy place, except thou repent. So we're not forgetting to love, uh, to remember to keep ourselves in the love of God. To make, make the love of God uh, on fire for God, not just going through the routines of daily Bible reading and prayer, but being on fire for God on purpose, a daily, uh, a daily uh, battle uh, where we keep ourselves in the love of God and keep ourselves motivated by His love to do, what we do, uh, to do what we do. And the second one, uh, I'm only going to mention two about the, 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 the law, or excuse me, about the commandments and the judgments and the precepts. The second one is just being full of care. Being full of care. We're in an anxious time right now uh, with all the wars and rumors of wars. But as believers, we don't need to be in an anxious time. We understand whom we have believed. Yeah, we understand there's wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and transgenderism, homosexuality, uh, men stealers. We understand all that, but we're not going to be moved by that. We're not going to be full of care because of food, finances, health, or any of that because uh, the Bible tells us in, in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. Let me say that again. Be careful of nothing. The disciples were full of care because of bread. They are full of care because they didn't bring bread. And Jesus had to rebuke them because they were worried about the bread. They were full of care. They reasoned among themselves. We don't need to be full of care of the things that are happening around us. Now, I'm, not talking, I'm talking about the kind of care, not where you pray for something. For instance, and I know my, my, my children will not like me mentioning this. I know them well enough. Um, but I hope they turn out right for the Lord. I have a care for that, not where I'm not trusting the Lord. Uh, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I, I, I have full confidence that my kids are going to make decisions for God, but I worry for them. I worry for their spirituality. I worry for their well-being, um, but I worry to the point that I pray about it, not that I'm going to uh, wring my hands or uh, be anxious about it, uh, I trust that they're going to make right decisions because we've done our, our best to try to train them. And they uh, are all born again. They have the Holy Spirit of God living in them. And that's for every young person in here. We're praying for each of you uh, that you make decisions that, that will glorify God, not just glorify uh, your parents or those around you, but will glorify the God that saved you. You raise your hand every Sunday that you're going to heaven. Then you ought to start acting like it, living like it, feeling like it, and putting to practice some of the things you're hearing this morning about falling in love with God and not loving Him with dissimulation. Loving Him on purpose. Because that love will motivate you, it'll supernaturally motivate you to do all kinds of things for His honor and glory. That love, uh, but not being full of care. Be, be careful for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Why would they forget? Why would they forget? Just a quick time out. I don't have my clock up here. Does anybody know where that clock is? I don't have my phone either. I've seen preachers do this before. It's a smartphone. It don't even turn on until you tap it. What am I... I'm just going to preach then. Um. <laughs> All right. So why would they forget God? Uh, uh, back, back to our Bible verse here in, in Deuteronomy. Why would they forget God? Uh, this is interesting why they forget God. Here's the warning. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in keeping of his commandments, his judgments, and his statute, which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten thou art full and hast built uh, goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and when, when thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and forget the Lord thy God. One word about forgetting God is prosperity. Plenty of food, built houses, and this is all of us. We are a rich nation. There's not anyone in here that I don't know unless you don't eat breakfast like I don't that didn't have breakfast available to you this morning, that aren't, aren't going to eat great when you leave this place, not going to eat great next Sunday when we meet together. By the way, don't forget, uh, don't forget to remember to bring your food next Sunday. All right, don't forget to bring the food next Sunday. 
That's vitally important. Uh, but we have godly, uh, g- goodly houses. We have uh, our, maybe our herds and our flocks, some, but n- not all. But our silver, our gold, our uh, profiles, our, our uh, interest gains, and all this other stuff has been multiplied. And this is when we're tempted to forget the Lord thy God. Um, if you don't come to Wednesday night church, I encourage you to come to Wednesday night church or Wednesday morning church. But there was a quote that would uh, ring out Wednesday night. And this is the quote. Uh, the character of a man brings prosperity but that prosperity can destroy the character of a man. And the character that we have to come to God, the character that we have to love God, when we're, and, and by, by the way, that's a by, by, the byproduct of loving God, keep his commandments, as he will open the heaven, windows of heaven and pour out blessings to us uh, that we cannot even uh, maintain or, or even fathom the blessings that God has for us. But with that comes a great warning of those blessings that we don't get complacent in our walk, our love for our Savior because of all the things that He has blessed us with. This is vitally important because verse 17, look what it says. This is a my, my, my problem. My, my, my. He says in verse 17, And thou say in thy heart, uh, my power and the might of mine hand have gotten me this wealth. My, my, my. The power, His own power. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee power to get wealth. It's God that puts breath in your lung every, lungs every day. It's God that gives us the strength and the ability to think and to work and to do all that we do. With that being said, everything we have and everything we do, everything belongs to God. Every single thing belongs to God. He gives us the responsibility with those things. A whole nother message about stewardship, but it's not our power. It's not our might. It's by the grace of God that we have, that we have uh, what we have. And we're not going to get to a point where we're lifted up in pride in that and forget our God. Uh, not remember the Lord thy God. Look what it says here in verse twelve or verse uh, fourteen. Uh, when thy heart be lifted up, and the forget, uh, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Uh, these folks were slaves in the land of Egypt, and God brought them out of uh, the house of bondage. That's his, uh, the slavery in Egypt. How? How have we been delivered from the house of bondage? We make applications to ourselves and, and the time that we live in right now. Now we know that Egypt pictures the world. The house of bondage. Uh, uh, um, what word did I say? Pictures. It pictures. Egypt pictures the world. Uh, the house of bondage pictures the sin debt that we're under. The sin debt, by the way, when you get saved, you're no longer under that sin debt. Sin no longer will have dominion over you, but out of the house of bondage. So how are we uh, that, that are here this morning and know Christ as our Savior, how are we delivered out of the house of bondage? I, I need you to remember that with me this morning. Let me tell you how we were not uh, delivered out of the house of bondage. It was not by man. There is not anything physical that man could do to get him out of the house of bondage. There's nothing physical that the Jewish folks could have done to get themselves out of the house of bondage of being slaves in Egypt. Uh, there had to be a miracle that took place. That's the only way that they can be delivered. We are, we are not delivered from the house of bondage by baptism. Can I say that again? And I want everyone to hear me on the internet, uh, in, the, in the auditorium. We are not delivered from the house of bondage by baptism. Uh, it is amazing to me that as many people as we talk to, we, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Yes. Well, how do you know that? First thing, I've been baptized. The first thing, let me tell you this, if that's anywhere in your answer, if that's anywhere in your answer, you're not saved. If baptism is anywhere in your answer, you're not saved. Jesus Christ is the answer. Well, I just told you the answer to the test. Anyway, Jesus Christ is the answer. You have to come to him in faith and believe on him. Also, what it's not by, it's not by the church. I love our church. I love Madison Baptist Church. But I'm not saved by this church. I'm not saved by, I'm not saved by anything that man can do. Now, I was taught for a long time that the church saved me, but it didn't. It doesn't and it didn't. The church does not save anyone. We're also not saved by keeping the law. Uh, what are we saved by? We are saved by a miracle. We are saved by a miracle. Uh, turn to Exodus chapter 12, and I'm going to show you the miracle that let the nation of Israel. Brother Noel, give me the time. Okay. The nation of Israel, Exodus 12, uh, just Exodus 12. Let's look at this miracle that uh, this is the last miracle that allowed the nation of Israel to be let 
uh, hold of, of the bondage of Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh finally saw his fault just for a little while, uh, and he let the people go. But it was a miracle that took place. Uh, in, in, in chapter 12 of Exodus, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron uh, in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you uh, the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take to every man a lamb according to his, the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if a household be too, too little for the, for the lamb, let him and his neighbor uh, next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make you uh, count for the lamb. Your lamb shall, this is very important, shall be without blemish. This lamb is going to be a picture of Christ. This lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from, uh, from the sheep or from the goats, just as Jesus was taken from sinful mankind and placed on that cross of Calvary. And number, verse number six, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of Israel, uh, excuse me, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door of the house wherein they shall eat. Now, I, I start getting excited about this right here. So what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to kill uh, the, un, the unblemished lamb. Uh, the first year as a male, male keep it as, as uh, at 14 days, and then the whole congregation uh, slay the lamb, just as uh, the Jews, the Pharisees, and Sadducees uh, said, crucify him, crucify him, let his blood be upon us and our children. But when they were commanded this to take that lamb, they put it on the doorpost. And if you had a door, I imagine they had wider doors than what we have now for all the, the cattle that they had. And when you take that blood, I want you to put it on the side of the post. This side, I want you to put a side on that post. And then I want you to put it on top of the, of the house and I want you to sprinkle the blood and have it for a blood covering for when I give a judgment upon Egypt and, 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 and the judgment comes upon them, then that covering of blood, will, I will pass over you and will not take the life of the firstborn as I will do with the nation of Israel. And if you look at those markings where they are, as his nails were in that cross to pay your sin debt and my sin debt, he's, pay, he's, he's shedding his blood on the side post. And as that crown of thorns was placed in his head, his head is then being on the, uh, the upper post of the door, which he is the door to heaven, paying the sin debt for all mankind. There has to be a miracle for you to be let out of the house of bondage. There has to be a miracle, and Jesus Christ was that miracle. He was born of a virgin. His name was called Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. And Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, being God, 100% God, 100% man. Out of God's veins throw the, flowed the life-giving blood that would be the sacrifice and the payment for our sin debt. And not only that, but he was placed in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, he rose from that tomb to give eternal life to all those that believe. All those that put their faith and trust in him, he will forgive your sins and promise you a home in heaven. And that is a miracle that God would be suspended between earth that he created and heaven that he owned, he would be suspended between heaven and earth, taking your sin debt and my sin debt upon him that we could be made free from the house of bondage. A miracle had to take place. A miracle of the new birth. We had a physical birth. That's a miracle in itself. When you watch babies being born and you see the miracle of life, uh, that is so, such an amazing thing. But that comes from mom. And that doesn't get you to heaven. There has to be a second birth it's a spiritual birth. And Jesus told Nicodemus, except the man be born again, he could not see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus didn't have a clue what he's talking about, just like most religious people don't. He says, do I have to enter my mother's womb and be born a second time? Jesus says, no. That which is born of the, uh, marvel not are, are, that you must be born of the water and of the spirit. That which, is born of, uh, uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said uh, said unto thee, or unto ye, ye must be born again. You have to have a spiritual birth, and that only comes uh, that you're under conviction this morning by the Holy Spirit of God. He said, well, why should I be under conviction? The reason you should be under conviction is because you have sinned against God. You've broken His law. You've sinned against His love. That's why you should be under conviction. Um, you also should be understanding that because 
of, of that sin debt that you're going to die one day. You're going to be under conviction by the Holy Spirit of God that you have sinned against God, that there's an awful pe a penalty of judgment upon you, which is death and hell, and then showing you also that Jesus Christ in His lo love and mercy paid that sin debt for you, was buried. Three days later, He rose from the dead. The Bible says this, um, for God so loved the world, in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. And they don't come to the light. And they won't come to that light, because they don't want to be accountable. They don't want to be reproved. But don't let that be you today. If you're lost and undone and haven't been rescued from the house of bondage, Put your faith in Jesus Christ today. Uh, we'll have an invitation here in a moment. And in our invitation, our tradition is we, we sing a song of Him. And if you find out by the Holy Spirit of God that you're not born again, in that tradition of that invitation, we ask that you step out of your pew and you come forward and you take one of the preachers by the hand. We have workers that have been trained in the Word of God to take you off in a sign room to, uh, not as loud as I'm being, but to, to, to very gently and patiently show you the scriptures that you're born again uh, by the Holy Spirit of God, by taking Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you could have the gift of eternal life. It is a gift. It's not by works. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That gift he wants to give to anyone uh, today who is not born again. Uh, that gift was given to me 21 years ago. Uh, you see, I was brought up in a home... Uh, I was brought up in the Catholic Church. I spent 25 years in the Catholic Church uh, because my grandparents were Catholic. Now, I'm not saying I was uh, Mr. Catholic, uh, like most Catholics. Uh, if you've been a Catholic here before or you are a Catholic, most Catholics don't really attend the Catholic Church except for uh, Christmas and Easter. Why? Because lost people. Uh, we're just trying to do our religious duties, uh, at least for, for me in, in, in the beginning of my life. Uh, I, went, I was baptized as an infant. Uh, I went about uh, trying to do good through catechism, and, and I don't know how many times I've done this in my life, uh, but I grew up very worldly in the public schools playing football and uh, getting so uh, in love with football uh, that that was, that was what I ate, drank, and slept. I really didn't care about much else. Uh, I got a scholarship, and uh, after that scholarship failed, I ended up getting a, a recruiter calling me, and he kept calling me, and he kept calling me. So when I joined the Navy, it wasn't for some patriotic reason. It's because I was living at my best friend's house with his mom. I was 19 years old, and the recruiter kept calling. And I knew that there was no direction. I had no parental direction. I definitely did not have the Holy Spirit of God or the Word of God uh, uh, directing me or guiding me. And so as that recruiter kept calling and calling and calling, I said, okay, this is an option for me to get out. So I got out and ended up going to boot camp, spent four years on an aircraft carrier, uh, the USS Carl Vinson Station over in the Seattle, Washington area. Uh, I got out uh, two months before 9-11. I saved up 60 days of terminal leave. Uh, once I got out of the Navy, I drove my pickup truck back to Texas where I'm from. And uh, I, the, the next month, I turned on the television and I watched uh, in a horrific uh, manner as planes slammed into buildings in New York City. Uh, and I was a lost, undone man as I'm watching this event take place. Uh, these planes are uh, bust, these, this plane busted into the building, then a second plane uh, and then as a reporter is given a report on all the, the horrific things that are happening, you hear this noise behind them. I couldn't detect what the noise was, uh, but then we realized it was bodies that were jumping out of the buildings to get away from the fire, and they were landing all around them. It was the, the most horrific noises that you could hear, and I began to weep. I began to get flooded with emotion. I began to realize how uh, vulnerable I was, how vulnerable our whole country was at this point. But God used this greatly. He used 19 men. 19 wicked men to wake me up. He was trying to, uh, these men were trying to uh, eradicate the world from infidels. That was their mission because that's what their God taught. And uh, not understanding that by, by, their, by their deed doing that, excuse me, a whole bunch of people would get born again. A whole bunch of people, not because of that deed, but that deed would be used in the heart of mankind to wake him up a little bit, and it did for, for a lot of people for a little while. Uh, but it woke me up to the point at the right time where a man uh, at the chemical refinery I was working at asked me if I died, didn't know for sure I'd go to heaven, and I didn't. 
Uh, I remember getting a lump in my throat that I didn't know for sure. He says at lunchtime, can I take you and teach you what the Word of God says? And I agreed to that. He began for the next weeks and weeks and weeks to teach me about my sin debt, uh, to teach me about uh, the, the penalty of sin, which is death and hell, uh, taught me that Jesus Christ had paid that sin debt. And, and it was about six to eight weeks later, uh, riding to work one morning, I uh, heard a gospel presentation on the radio. And that morning, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. At a red light of all places, I said, Jesus Christ, would you save me? Would you forgive me? I'm now putting all my faith and trust in you. Would you take me to heaven when I die? And at that moment, I did not have uh, a religious experience other than I got born again. That's a miracle right there. That miracle at that red light, when I got delivered from the house of bondage, I got born again. And when I got to work that morning, I couldn't cuss anymore. Did you hear what I said? I couldn't cuss anymore. I was a cussing Catholic. But I couldn't cuss anymore. God began to work in my heart to then have a desire for the Word of God, desire to hunger and thirst after the things of God. The miracle of the two births. Today, if you're here with us uh, and you've only been born one time, the stark reality is you're going to die twice. You're going to die physically. You're going to die spiritually. That's just a matter of fact. If you've only been once, if you have one birthday, a physical birthday, you're going to die twice, physically and spiritually. But if you experience that second birth by taking Christ as your Savior, believing on Him, accepting Him, then you only have, uh, you only have one death day. You'll have two birthdays at that point. You'll have a physical birthday, a spiritual birthday, and you'll never have to worry about that physical death that happens uh, that those, to those that go in the grave. Uh, so today is a day of, of getting saved, and I'm going to close with this last passage of Scripture. And, and, this is, and I do need to look at my watch. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, with this last passage of Scripture, if you turn with me, 1 Samuel uh, 17, I meant to give more time to this, uh, but we are running out of time. But this is the message uh, for believers today, if you're here. Um, rem- don't forget to remember. Don't forget to remember the victories of the past. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to read this story, and then we're going to dismi- uh, We're going to have invitation. Uh, if God's spoken to your heart about, about your love for Him, that's between you and God, and you do business with God as we have the invitation here in a minute. Or if you're not saved, you just, by faith, step out of that pew, come forward. That's going to be the invitation day. But I want to close with this passage of Scripture in 1 Samuel uh, 17. And I'll just read a few verses here, and starting in verse 29. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Uh, he turned from him and, and, and toward another and spake after, this, after the same manner. And the people answered him again after uh, the former manner. And so this kept get repeating because David's, uh, because of his heart, his faith to the Lord. Is there not a cause kept getting repeated, repeated, repeated? And verse 31, and when the words were heard, uh, which David spake, they were rehearsed. Uh, when the words were heard, uh, which David spake, they were rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail him because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, thou art not, but, uh, thou art not able to go against this Philistine or Philistine uh, to fight with him, for thou art but a youth. And he is a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept thy father's sheep. And there came out a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. And thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing that he had delivered, the, that he had defiled the armies of the living God. Uh, and if you'll go down to uh, uh, verse, uh, d- verse 37, and David, I'll just keep reading. And moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. Uh, all of us who've been saved uh, for some times have experienced God's uh, blessings and uh, answers to prayers. God working uh, in, despite our in, inability, God has worked through us and given us uh, many blessings in our life. He's answered many prayers, uh, but our problem is that sometimes we forget those blessings that he's give, given to us. Just as the disciples uh, forgot to bring bread, we forget the miracles. David, uh, when he was a teenager, by, with his own hands, he killed a lion and a bear. And there's no way he could have done this without God's power upon him. He drew on that past memory to be able to face the giant that he had before Goliath. As we remember to stay in love with God, as we remember to uh, seek to obey His Word and, 
and fulfill the commandments of loving the Lord God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, loving our neighbors, ourself, and we draw on the past victories that God has given us for the giant that is ahead. We have giants ahead. Every one of us have giants ahead, but as we look to God who will deliver, then we're able to look internally and realize that we can trust in the Lord with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and we can have faith in Him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come again before you and we thank you so much uh, for the deliverance that we have from the house of bondage. Father, I pray that your word would ring true in the ears and hearts of, of, of each of us here. Father, for those that are saved, that you would continue to remind us to keep ourselves in love with you, uh, that we would not set our affections on things of this earth, but we would set our affections on things above, uh, that we would love you, Father, that we would love each other. Lord, you say on this hang all the, the law and the prophets. And Father, that we would uh, remember the past victories that you've given us. And I pray this morning for those in, in, in the assembly today or over the internet that have not taken you a Savior, that uh, they would see their need and they would have a, a godly love to trust you as Savior and that you save them out of the house of bondage, that you save them from the penalty of sin and death and hell. Father, I pray that some would place their faith in you today. Lord, would you have your perfect way and will as we have the invitation? Would you lead and guide in that? For we pray and ask it all in Jesus' name.